Uh, so a lot of this is fairly new research. It's kind of undigested, and and I'd be very keen for, for feedback, especially about drawing into some of the, some of what we've already been talking about. Um, but to start off with, in September of 1933, the London, the London publicist and kind of political agent Sidney Walton wrote in his diary that one thing only would tempt me to be a conservative member of parliament, and that is the charm of the Carlton Club. Um, the Carlton Club, while at the time Walton actively disliked and was in certain ways working against the Conservative Party, and he was working with Liberal and Labour or former Labour politicians on multiple projects, and he was very keen on, on kind of his, his own ideals of social and political reform, he spent a lot of time at the Carlton with clients and with colleagues. Uh, he noted in his diaries of, of eating the first strawberries of the spring there, and he and the elegance of its decorations. This is the modern Carlton Club. I imagine it was somewhat different in 1933. And he also noted frequently the quality of its food. He really enjoyed being there, even though it was the it was the home of of the people at the time whom he saw as his political kind of. Eh, enemies, effectively. <laughs> so my interest in this comes out of discovering, or not, not really disco discovering, but finding Walton's diaries from 1933 until 1942, uh, which were recently acquired by the British Library after being held in private hands. And these 28 volumes of wow. diaries, mostly typewritten, are a rich source for interwar social and political history for Britain. Walton had a wide circle of acquaintances from multiple social classes and interest groups, and he loved gossip. He also loved talking about other people's finances, which is quite interesting as well, although never his own. The diaries seem to have been written as some kind of literary exercise, and for Walton's use as a record of his rather complex personal and, and business dealings. Most, but not all, were typed by his secretaries, who were named Miss White and Miss Christmas, from his handwritten originals in green ink. Which, and he used green ink for everything. The most intense period of coverage for these diaries is 1933 to 1935, and during this time he made entries nearly every day, some of them very detailed. Later in the decade, they, become, they became shorter and more cursory. Uh, every now and then he'd say, oh, I'm going to give up give, writing my diaries sometime, and then be, there'd be another entry for a few weeks later. And, and they peter out in 1942 uh, during the Second World War. And whatever his intentions, the record he left is an unusually vivid source for historians of all of Walton's varied interests, which include religion, journalism, publicity, politics, patronage, corruption, business, sex, and political economy. So in 1933, British society and politics were very much in transition. Uh, in, in the early 20th century, British industries were in decline. The, the Great Depression makes this worse. And there are, but there are also new industri industries emerging, many of which Walton has close connections to. Air and motor transport, he has connections to bicycle companies, electricity, and various forms of consumer manufacturing. The, the economic uncertainty and dynamism was reflected in, in struggles around social status, class roles, and kind of uncertainty about these things. A number of historians um, notably Matt Holbrook have written in, in quite a lot of detail about how social roles are becoming less clear and often less certain, a lot of imp people impersonate, impersonating people of other social classes in, in, this, in the interwar period. In politics, the emergence of the Labour Party as a viable political force created challenges for the traditional political establishment but also for the Labour Party itself. And in 1931, uh, Ramsay MacDonald's Labour government splits, and MacDonald, in, in, who is a Labour tradition, well, who was a Labour Prime Minister, ends up forming a coalition with some with the Conservative Party and some members of the kind of dying, fading Liberal Party. Uh, and so, at the time of the that I'm focusing on, Britain is being governed by a coalition government led by a Labour, a former Labour Prime Minister, but made up of people from various different parties. 
so on the one hand, Ramsay MacDonald, the Prime Minister, is, is sort of beset by, by his former Labour colleagues who see him as having betrayed the Labour cause. And on the other hand, he is under a lot of pressure from his kind of tenuous conservative allies led by Stanley Baldwin here, wearing a great fur, fur, um, fur coat. And uh, the third figure here, who I'll mention briefly later, is Jim Thomas, one of the uh, one of the people who remain one of the working class Labour politicians who remained on the side of Macdonald, who didn't go away, who go off with the rest of the Labour Party into opposition. So this connects to my previous work in that Walton talks a lot about on the honor system. He is someone through whom various different newly wealthy clients are trying to buy honours from the government. I'm not going to go into all the detail about this, it's very interesting uh, and, and it's very vivid in these diaries, but, but the key thing here is that there's sort of a um, tension about the, 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 the sort of social and political, social, social and political changes play out in the debates about the purchase of honours. This purchase of honours has been going on for a long time in British politics, a very, very long time before this, but because there are so many new groups with new money and because political funding is kind of in a precarious situation, there are a lot of, there are a lot of debates within parties and within the wider public about the use of political, uh, political honours and the sale of political honours. Walton is at the centre of this and has been for a long time. He, um, the most famous seller of political honours is a man named, a man named Maudie Gregory who became notorious, he was eventually prosecuted. Uh, Bolton is doing a lot of the same things but he, he is never prosecuted. He, 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 is, he kind of remains a reasonably respectable um, user of this. this. This is a painting, it's in the Jeffrey Museum in London, um, which kind of conveys some of what I want to get at really nicely. This is uh, depicting the arrival of the Jarrow marches in London in 1936. This was a, this was a uh, quite highly publicised protest about um, unemployment where a group of marchers marched from the north of England to London to present a petition to Parliament. It was, it was kind of well organised by, by um, a couple of Labour MPs at the time. Oh, MPs at the time. But it's, it's contrasting the arrival of these protesters with the interior of, of kind of People lounging around in, in relative luxury, and, and this is one of this is one of the contrasts. This is one of the reasons why I think this is connected to thinking about the, the senses that the, the luxury comes through really strongly in Walton's diaries. In the same contrast, that he is very concerned about poverty, but he's also very into luxury, and he's very into describing the luxuries he's encountering on a daily basis with his clients, and he sees the. He sees the manipulation of the various uh, wealthy clients he has as being a way of, of, of um, inserting his political causes into, into, into national politics. But he's also really very much enjoying these luxuries. Okay. Oh. I'm going to try and skip some of this. Oh, I'm going to skip. Right. I'm going to skip this paragraph, but one, one, of, one of the things that, that I was going to talk about is there, there's an occasion where a New Zealand writer, Hector Bolitho, visits London and then writes about Walton in, his, in, in a book that he publishes called Older, Older People. Um, it's a this weird travelogue of meeting older people. <laughs> it's a very strange book. But, but in it, he describes Walton, and he describes Walton, and not only he doesn't name him, but he describes him as being very, very much in, in, in kind of, um, as being plump, soft-voiced, and powerful. And Walton likes every one of these. He is happy to be described as plump. That was, that was part of his image, i this. You can see him here. Um, Looking, unfortunately, like Richard Nixon, sort of, but, but he, he didn't really look like Richard Nixon. Um, but, but he liked being called plump, he liked being called soft-voiced, and he liked being called powerful. And I think all three of these things played into that, the persona that he was wanting to project uh, to his clients and to the world. He was disappointed at being dis as, as that he wasn't named in this book, but in certain ways that was appropriate because he was very much an anonymous figure working behind the scenes. Okay. 
So during the First World War, Walton worked in the Ministry of Munitions and the Ministries of Food. He was part of this kind of network of, uh, what's the right term? A slightly sinister network of uh, political agents that the government used to, to um, maintain the momentum of its propaganda during the First World War. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the dance music of time, there's a way in which he's he's kind of Woodmer Pudlian figure, the, the character called Woodmer Paul, who Walton occasionally reminds me of, although he's much nicer in certain ways. But he emerges from the war as uh, with kind of a lot of excellent connections in business and in and in um, in government. He was involved in, and and in, actually in the royal household. He was involved in something called the Victory Loan, which was a government fundraising effort at the end of the First World War. Um, you can see him here on the left, talking, uh, helping organise this this loan. And he was very proud of us for the rest of his life. He, he declined high honours. He accepted a CBE, which is one level below a knighthood. He could have got a knighthood, probably, but he seems to have wanted to avoid getting a title. So he, he, he saw himself as being kind of an everyman figure. Um, and I'm, I'm writing an article at the moment, which goes into this in a lot more detail. Uh, he was really fond of this newspaper called The Everyman, and that seems to have been a reflection of this this love the idea that he's kind of this ordinary British, ordinary English, actually, with every man. Um, even though he wasn't. He was from a relatively modest, middle, middle, lower middle class background uh, from rural England. He was from, um, from a town near Durham. So, as I hinted at earlier, Walton's politics were kind of left of centre, not really not really, he was not a Communist Party member, but he, he was kind of invested in uh, kind of the, kind of, he was, he was, a, liber he was, a, he was a liberal. He, he was very enthusiastic about the emergence of central planning as, as, a, as, a, means of, as a means of managing the economy and of, and of society. Um, but he was also an agent for clients with a variety of politics, and he was very good at noticing and adept at using sensory stimuli to manipulate politicians, especially Labour and ex-Labour politicians such as Macdonald, the Prime Minister. So bribes of carpets, books and money, negotiations at music concerts, long lavish lunches at gentlemen's clubs like the Carlton were part of Walton's everyday um, political activities. Uh, Walton's world was one of luxury. As a publicist, and as a publicist he, who identified with new trends in American journalism and marketing, he was enthusiastic about the new technologies and, the, and their kind of power to impact um, the, the minds of people involved in politics. And about new ways of marketing them through appealing to mass psychology and to sensation. So he, he was really into thinking about, and cigarette cards at this point have you know, been around for, for a couple of decades, but he, he's always talking with his clients about how, how, what's a new way we can get something new in cigarette cards or, or new in cigarette packets that'll attract a wider audience. And, and he's, one of the things he suggests is we could give like replica medals, which is like not gonna happen because replica medals right after the First World War is a really terrible idea. <laughs> um, but but he, he's very, he's very, he's always talking about new, Ways to appeal to the senses of his of, of of his audiences. So one of the ways this plays out specifically is that he's always very attentive to the to the appearance and feel of the rooms where, which he stays and visits, especially the rooms of new clients. He will always comment not just on how they felt, but on how how they felt reflected the personality and the race or, or the, the culture of his clients. So uh, on one occasion in November 1934, he goes to the China, a room called the Chinese Room of Buckingham Palace. Um, I'm not, I don't know, I, I'm sure that I could do a little more research into what this was. But he, he, he calls this scarlet in the day's gloom. And this reflected the mood of that meeting, which was hopefully, he, he, he saw this as being a kind of, 
he was really hopeful about this meeting. It doesn't really go anywhere, but but at the time he was very hopeful about it, um, and he was kind of contrasting the, the the brightness of the room with the um, the gloominess of a London November, which is pretty gloomy. I've definitely gone to the National Gallery to escape rain in the past, and that, that's a very fit, that seems entirely reasonable to me. <laughs> When, when one of his main clients, Julian Kahn, hosted him in the summer of 1934 to thank, to thank him for helping secure Kahn a baronetcy, which is this amazing story, which is what I'm writing this article about, he commented on the perfection of Kahn's taste. Kahn was a newly wealthy, um, higher purchase magnate. So the cultured, tasteful decorations of Kahn's guest room showed him a messiness, uh, according to Walton. Shortly afterwards, Walton was much less complimentary um, about another potential client, Isaac Wolfson, a Jewish business, uh, like Khan, a Jewish businessman who ho whom Walton hoped would employ him. He, he, he found the apartment to represent a different sort of luxury. It was richly furnished with a Jew's liking for display. I almost slip on the polished marble flat floor of the Spanish entrance with a weight, a weight Walt Wolfson in his study, surrounded by wonderful choice of modern books, but not his choice. <laughs> we sit down to lunch on high red back chairs, everything oriental in manner and not English. So, so in this case, with these two, two Jewish clients, who are from very, quite similar backgrounds, he, he was very interested in how the interiors of these rooms reflected a difference in taste and in culture. Later, when he disagrees with Khan, he kind of goes back to a very different portrayal of Khan in his diaries, but that's sort of a different story. So when McDonald's secretary, Rose, uh, Rosie Rosenberg, um, hit, oh, I hit that oh, okay. he also was very proud of his view from his office at 3 St. James, St. James's Square London, which was one of the tallest buildings in London at the time. And he would all, he, it was clearly important to him that he would impress clients by having this view of, of central London. So as a last example of this, uh, Rose, McDonald's secretary Rosie Rosenberg kind of hit Khan up for, for new interior decorations for her new apartment at one point. Um, Julian Khan again was a, was a furniture magnate. Um, Khan, uh, Walton comments that this is very, very, this is very sly when, when that Rosenberg is getting um, Rosenberg is getting um, a new carpet from Khan. Not that, a couple of months later in his diaries, Julian Kahn calls with Joe Redding and they decide on the general scheme to make these offices of mine absolutely beautiful and modern. So he, he's doing the same thing, but, but it's kind of a different, has a different, has a different uh, meaning here. Kahn wants me to see Jim Thomas with a secret message. And again, at the same time, and so there's a lot going on in these diaries, at the same time he's arranging to, for Kahn to pay off some of Jim Thomas' the, that politician's, uh, Jim Thomas's many debts. And, and Jim Thomas is, is important here because he, he, he later ends up being kind of disgraced in the political scandal um, over where he is alleged to have been supplying uh, businessmen with information about government fiscal policy. It's not clear that he was, but, but he was exactly the sort of person who would get tangled up with this kind of thing. He was, a, he was from, a, from a work class background, he was a, came out of the, union, the, the trades union movement, but he was someone who, again, was very much integrated into London high society. He was good friends with George V and with um, the future Edward VIII. Uh, um, they, who, both of whom loved his kind of coarse humor and, and they were like his, their working class friend kind of. Or he was their working class friend. Um, and, and that's kind of where, where I think, this, what, what I think is interesting about this is there's a, there's a bigger story about the integration of labor into, into British politics here. The, these are working class men and women entering British politics who are encountering a world where it's not just about political corruption in the form of, of money. In fact, I think it's not, not even really money that's central here. It's the what yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the, the work here that luxury is doing and that the kind of the this world of clubs, of free carpet, and of other um, other luxuries, that's kind of integrating and, and sort of changing Labour Party as they enter politics in the in the nineteen twenties and thirties. <laughs>